What's up, folks? Happy Thursday. Uh, welcome to yet another VMR. Uh, I'm a little bit less stressed for some for one reason and more stressed for the other. The less stress is I usually, uh, as you probably have gotten the hang of, usually try to prepare an intro for the uh, co-facilitator that I have. But this is actually a, an accidental second uh, with Alec and I. Alec and I jumped in to facilitate uh, Wednesday session. And so I uh, did my best to embarrass him, make him blush and celebrate all his amazing accomplishments in and outside clinical reasoning. So I'm less stressed because I have to do less of that. Um, and more stress because Shreyas has been preparing a case for us uh, for quite some time uh, that involves many uh, uh, self-conversations and reflections with other team members. And I'm really, really excited to share the stage with both of them today, both amazing at CP Solvers Academy uh, team members. Uh, I'll pass the mic to Alec to say hi, who I know is deep in clinical reasoning this week, more so maybe than other weeks. Um, and then to Shreyas, and we'll jump right in. Amazing. Always so kind as always, Robbie. Yeah. Um, today is a, you know, every, this week was a particularly clinically reasoning heavy week, but wouldn't have it any other way. So um, Shreyas, uh, you know, his cases are always amazing. So I'm feeling a little nervous, but excited to learn and yeah, I'm ready to get started uh, whenever you are. All right. Uh, first, before starting, I just want to thank Anmol uh, for helping uh, me put together this case. And we did a lot of brainstorming before uh, uh, making finalizing this case. So we got on a call and she helped me. Uh, she asked me some questions, uh, which I had to dig and find some answers for. So I'm excited to present them. So uh, I'm ready whenever the whiteboard is up. So a chief complaint, a 50-year-old woman presented with one-week history of worsening shortness of breath and black tarry stools. Uh, I, I'll just go on with the history of presenting illness. Uh, the shortness of breath was insidious in onset and gradually progressed since the past three months. The patient complained of shortness of breath even with mild exertion. And two weeks prior to her current presentation, the patient was diagnosed with COVID-19 pneumonia. The patient also noted yellowish discoloration of both eyes since the day prior to her current presentation, but no pruritus or clay-colored stools. She had an episode of acute viral gastroenteritis one week prior to the current presentation, which has since then resolved. The patient also mentioned black stools two weeks prior to the current presentation, which has also stopped since the last two days. She noted a gradually worsening abdominal distension since the past three months. She was also frequently hospitalized since May 2023, and uh, she was seen in September 2023, so it's about four months of polyuria, polydipsia, and recurrent on and off fevers, and the fevers have been getting worse in the recent past. And she was seen at multiple hospitals and during her most recent, before she came to the current, in her current presentation, she went to a hospital and she was diagnosed with complicated UTI and she was treated with nitrofurantoin, 100 milligrams and ciprofloxacin. And the rest of the review of systems is negative. She does not complain of any chest pain, cough, orthopnea, decreased urine output, facial puffiness, frothy urine, blood in the urine, weakness, stiffness, myalgias, loss of consciousness, seizures, or any sort of bowel or bladder incontinence. Oh my gosh. Alec, I'm really curious to just capture what your what your reflections are, not on what's going on, but how, on how you're feeling and tracking about what's going on. Oh, uh, Shreya's just sort of kept on going and I, I didn't know... Uh... <laughs> What uh, to say then when he said the review systems was otherwise negative, uh, I didn't know things could be more positive. So, um, <laughs> it, no, I just, um, you know, I, I think it, it's certainly a lot of information and overwhelming. And, you know, Shreyas gave us a nice timeline here. And I, I think it's really hard for me to say off the, the top about it. it seems like this shortness of breath that she's been experiencing has, has been a little bit more subacute to chronic and progressive. And she's had some other more acute related things. And it's hard to know how much of this layers into the past history or how much they're related or whether there are multiple concurrent processes going on. It's certainly possible to think that there's something more longstanding that was contributing to the dyspnea. 
um, and then just got COVID and had a few different complications related to that, just with um, some worsening of the dyspnea and, and then the gastroenteritis and, and other things and the black stools. Um, but as far as, you know, how to make progress from here, I, I think I, I would just go back to the chief complaint and frequently I do that, um, you know, because patients come in with lots of different things when you ask them, but frequently what they tell you is what they think is the most important. And so I think I would be anchoring myself in that. And um, progressive shortness of, of breath, certainly we would anchor ourselves in the cardiopulmonary system just by base rate. And then the black tarry stools really adds an interesting extra dimension to this where we get further up into the pyramid um, looking at the blood. Um, and you always have to be a little bit cautious with the black tarry stools. Frequently we will evoke a GI bleed because that's the most sinister, but could have blood from other places um, you know, higher up in the, um, the pharyngeal tract. Um, and you could sort of think of a way where anemia could contribute to dyspnea as well. Um, you know, and as far as the yellow discoloration, we could sort of layer that in and how that <laughs> they might contribute to a, you know, hepatobiliary process or potentially hemolysis and how that may um, fit with black tarry stools. And then, um, you know, how the polyuria and polydipsnia and the fevers all relate. Honestly, it's a little difficult for me to say. So I, I think in a case like this, um, I would probably take note of everything, um, talk about the time course, and then probably uh, really get more background information particularly with the recent hospitalizations and everything else, and then try to create a problem list of everything that's going on the patient and which one we need to prioritize either because the severity or because of what the patient is complaining about or things that uh, came on more acutely that we're going to need to solve more acutely. But um, that's what I'm sort of thinking, Robbie, what are, what are your thoughts? I think you're articulating so well that the very tension in the beginning of a conversation with the patient is to try to tease out, well, what is signal for the for the current purposes and what is noise? And I think if you use the analogy of the value add of a CAT scan over a chest X-ray, you ultimately realize that what is what the difference between a CAT scan and X-ray is not much. It's basically a CAT scan is millions of X-rays circumferentially going around and around and around and around and around and, around and integrated together. And I think what you're what we're probably trying to gonna gonna try to do here is to take everything that the patient has says says and try to see if we can merge that with another data point from another aspect of data collection. So if a patient says, hey, you know, I've noticed yellow discoloration in my eyes, but you look at her eyes right then and there and you don't see the said discoloration, you're much more likely to say, actually, that's probably either intermittent or absent. And so here, what you're going to try to do, I think, for the rest of this case is to try to understand what the relevant problems are, is to understand if there is another dimension in the medical history, in the, in the exam, in the labs, by which the HPI can be attached to something. And I think and the absence of being able to do that in the moment, what do we what do we tend to do? We tend to latch on to things that either are very morbid, as you did with shortness of breath, or have a very specific differential diagnosis that is very, very narrow. And so I think that's why the shortness of breath stands out. And that's why the discoloration, yellow discoloration of the eye stands out, because that translates to two very specific and very small schemas fundamentally. But another dimension that I think is true in real life is if the H, the observation that the patient has or is sharing can be immediately verified with data points in a quick manner. So abdominal distension, you can see it right then and there. Yellow eyes, you can see it right then and there. Shortness of breath, you can see it right then and there. And so I think that right now what would be happening is the simultaneous synthesis of your eyes with the patient's own eyes on her experience of the disease. And you're going to try to synthesize and merge those things to see what's signal and what's noise. And right now, I think it is impossible to know. So what, what, would I, what would I be doing in real life? I think this is the value of the simultaneous collection of the exam and the history. You're never doing one without the other. Um, and so I have absolutely no idea what the problem is. And I think um, integrating that with um, the observations with the eyes, the observations in the chart are, is going to help us tease out which of the 10 things we could be chasing here are going to be very, very valuable. But to summarize, as you said, more morbid things get our attention, more specific things get our attention. And things that have a, the ability to be rapidly viewed from another angle, like shortness of breath, like uh, uh, yellow eyes, but not like polyuria, um, are things that um, will probably be much more easy to see if they are uh, existent to the problem at hand or independent of the problem at hand. So let's let's keep doing that, Treya. Sure, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually uh, thought of... Uh 
uh, coming up with a clue like how Kirtan and Vijay do, but then I couldn't come up with something. So I'm just going to continue with the rest Thanks. of the uh, presentation. I don't know if so, you notice. Uh, I always cover my ears whenever Kirtan does. I, I, don't, I don't. Because the patient doesn't come with a clue, right? The patient isn't here. Hi, I hear a shortness of breath and my title is, you know. So uh, I, I appreciate you not doing it. <laughs> You know, Kirtan's the patient whisperer, so. <laughs> so her concern was uh, polyuria and polydipsia, which was getting worse. That's what she seemed to be mm -hmm. most bothered about. So talk about her past medical history. Uh, she she has she was diagnosed with hypertension a, a long time ago, and um, she's been taking amlodipine for that. And she also has, um, she's, she has type 2 diabetes, uh, which is well controlled uh, on metformin, 500 milligrams and cetagliptin, 50 milligrams. And with regards to her uh, family history, there's uh, no significant family history per se. Uh, her social history, she is a non-smoker and she does not uh, consume any alcohol. And uh, she has no known allergies. And uh, the vitals, uh, she had a temperature when she was examined of 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 110 over 70 millimeters of mercury, pulse rate was 110 per minute, respiratory rate of 30 per minute, and her saturation was 89% on room air. And for her exam, uh, she there was pallor uh, bilaterally and sclera were notably ectric. Um, and for the head and neck and ENT exam, there was right-sided, palpable, non-tender, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. The extraocular movements were intact, and the rest of the cranial nerve exams and ocular movements were within normal limits. And there was a rash, which was noted on the face, but for the purposes of privacy, I won't be sharing that. There was a rash elsewhere as well, and I'll be sharing the image for that. For the extremities exam, uh, there was bilateral fitting edema, which was noted up to the level of the mid thighs, no rashes or any sort of joint pains. And the skin exam, there were petechial lesions and there was a maculopapular rash in the scalp, neck, abdomen, and the inguinal region. And what seemed to be crusted papules were also noted near the left shoulder. And once I'm done with the CVS and the rest of the uh, reveal systems, I will share the screen and uh, you can have a look at the rash, which was noted. So the cardiovascular exam, um, the S1, S2 was heard and there was no additional heart sounds or murmurs. And for her abdominal exam, the spleen tip was palpable uh, near the umbilicus. So there was notable splenomegaly on physical exam. And for her Pulmonary exam, crackles were auscultated bilaterally, but more prominent in the right lower lung fields. Uh, CNS exam was within normal limits, except for a uh, mildly decreased patellar reflex bilaterally. Apart from that, there was normal bulk, tone, power, and reflexes elsewhere. And I will take a moment and just share my screen for now, uh, just to give you a picture of the rash, which was noted. Uh, to share my screen. Um, okay. So this was the rash which was noted in the abdomen and there's another picture. This rash was also there on her face uh, near the right eyebrow. So this is the rash and I have one more picture. That's all I have for this aloe. My gosh, uh, very very intriguing and a great now synthesis of the HPI with the uh, with the exam data. Alec, where are you at? Yeah, just uh, amazing um, so far, Shreyas. Um, there's so many things that are catching um, my attention. I mean, I think I'll, I'll just start from the past medical history. Um, she's 50. The diagnosis she has seemed to potentially be related with her age, and so I, I'm not evoking some sort of weird schemas there. Um, the amlodipine I'm tracking um, just with the edema that we'll talk more about in the exam. 
And certainly it seems like the patient is concerned about the polyuria and polydipsia and, and diabetes and hypertension. Frequently, we do use medications that could cause um, polyuria, and I don't see any of those there. So that's something that I'm also tracking. Um, the social history, we don't get a background necessarily of bad habits. I would be interested to know where the patient is um, located, if they have traveled recently, and how that could layer into a diagnosis as well. Um, and then um, the vitals, it's certainly concerning. Uh, we get a true uh, objective point of inflammation with the significant temperature elevation. And you know the blood pressure is 110 over 70, but in a patient with a history of hypertension, certainly that could be very concerning as well. Um, the patient is quite tachypnic. I think the respiratory rate was 30. I think if Shreyas, if I remember correctly, um, and the patient is hypoxic objectively on room air. And then we get to exam and uh, both has pallor and scleral um, conjunctival icterus. And um, certainly the pallor makes me think about anemia. And then the uh, icterus makes me think about uh, frequently hemolysis or simply hepatobiliary. And then that sort of in my mind initially in first pass activated you know, the sort of anemia and the sort of jaundice schema and where those may overlap, whether that's from intravascular hemolysis potentially, um, or whether that's a, a GI hepatobiliary related cause leading to bleeding, um, you know, per variceal bleed in a patient with cirrhosis, for example. Um, but we're gonna have to get more information, particularly in our labs and our future imaging to, to, to really um, anchor on that diagnosis. But certainly with the two in combination, um, I, I think will provide a significant diagnostic clue going forward. The right, um, sort of unilateral seemingly palpable, non-tender lymphadenopathy, um, certainly something we're going to need to explain. Um, the unilaterality would make me think that there's something in that area that's leading to it. Um, but, you know, our exam isn't perfect to pick up lymphadenopathy elsewhere as far as the diffuse is concerned. And then the patient does have palpable splenomegaly, and perhaps that is what's causing the distension um, that they were discussing before as a, maybe sort of the solid component of the solid liquid gas schema that we're feeling activate for abdominal distension. The crackles definitely folks that there's focality in the lung and the vitals would back that up. And I think just pushes us forward that we're going to need advanced imaging uh, of the lungs here to really make um, further diagnostic progress. The neuro exam, the bilateral patellar reflexes, I'm just ignoring, uh, frankly, uh, there's so much cognitive um, overload as there is. And I'm not, don't feel at this time that there's a clear neurologic signature to the presentation. So I'm sort of just tracking that, but I'm not going to focus so much on it. And the edema isn't something necessarily that I was expecting. Um, but in combination with the dyspnea, certainly you could think about vascular leak syndromes or um, a cardiopulmonary, particularly a cardiac cause leading to edema. Uh, we didn't get a sense of the JVD, which would potentially be helpful. And then the particular regions, uh, lesions, um, certainly looks like petechia based off the picture. I would be um, interested to know if this is palpable or not. Um, and then, you know, if the patient had any local trauma to the areas where, um, particularly on the face, I don't typically think about like thermocytopenia causing lesions on the face, but that could just be a knowledge gap of mine. And, um, you know, the macular papular rash, whether or not this was something that happened after the bio antibiotics that she received or before, and how long this has truly been going on. Um, so, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of problems that will potentially be solving, but um, to make a full um, problem representation, I don't think I have all the information I need yet, and I'll be sort of waiting very patiently for the labs, particularly the CBC and the, and the CMP in particular, um, and then waiting for advanced imaging uh, of the lungs um, and then a urinalysis as well with the edema. Um, so lots of things uh, that I'm thinking about. I don't really have a clear sense of what's going on quite yet, but I'd love to hear what you're thinking, Robbie. You know, I completely agree with you. I think that the the the, the um, most important lesson to impart to everybody taking care of uh, of taking care of future patients like this is to not fall into the tendency that you shouldn't be in problem solving mode. Now you're trying to understand what the problem is, and I think what the the progress that we've made is we've confirmed this is an inflammatory disease. We've confirmed based on the hypoxia that there's pulmonary involvement of the disease. And we've really suggested based on the lymphadenopathy and the splenomegaly that there's a reticular endothelial component to this disease. So, so far, we can confidently say this is a subacute inflammatory pulmonary and reticular endothelial disease. And the open questions that remain that are of remaining significance are, does the jaundice, so, uh, does the jaundice take us to heme or does the jaundice take us to hepatic? which of the two H's? Does the uh, uh, rash and the petechia take us to cytopenias, take us to a bleeding problem, or take us to a vessel wall problem? Um, and does the polydipsia and polyuria take us to hyperglycemia, or take us to other causes of either osmotic or non-osmotic causes of polydipsia and polyuria? So there's three grounds of stability, inflammation, pulmonary, and 
uh, reticular endothelial, and there's three dimensions of speculation. Which of the two H's are hepatic or heme and at play for the jaundice? What is the nature of the polyuria and the polydipsia? And what significance in terms of the blood and the, uh, and the blood vessels does this RAS signify? And the good news is on labs, you'll be able to understand which of the two H's is leading. You'll be able to understand if there are cytopenias to suggest this, and you'll be able to get insight into some blood vessel wall issues and potentially the polydipsia and polyuria. So don't try to solve this problem now. You're wasting your time and you could, you could hit a Hail Mary and think of the diagnosis right now, but I guarantee you that if you did that every single time, you'd be more wrong than you would be right. Um, so I'm definitely like you, Alec, in problem clarification mode. And I think the labs will be able to really give us a much more clear view of what's going on than we have right now. All right, Treyas, Mike, to you, my friend. Okay. Um, so I'll start off with their serum electrolytes first. Um, on this admission, the sodium was 149. And uh, like I mentioned, she was visiting multiple hospitals in the past. And um, last month at another uh, hospital, her electrolytes were, sodium was 155. And urine osmolarity at that time was 114 milliosmoles per liter. And when there was the water deprivation test, which was done, the urine osmolarity was checked after administering desmopressin, and it rose to 670. Uh, the patient was diagnosed with idiopathic central diabetes insipidus at, in her previous hospital visit, and she was started on 0 0.1 milligram once daily desmopressin. And that's about the sodium. And potassium is 3.7 on this visit. The chloride was 113. Creatinine was 0 0.68. BUN of 15, and the total bilirubin was 0 0.5, and the direct and indirect components were within normal limits. AST was 30, ALT of 22, and ALP was 70. Total protein was 6.5, albumin was 2.75, uh, GTT was normal. She had a HbA1c of 7.0, and calcium was 9.8, total cholesterol of 252, LDL was 142, and triglycerides were 365, ESR was 60, and CRP was 7.16, both of which are elevated. And uh, she, had, uh, she had some other testing also done, so should I just talk about it right now, or do you want to reflect on this information for some time? You have a, we've never had hypernatremia and VMR as far as I can remember, to be honest with you. Um, so let's take a moment to reflect on it. It's a, I think it's a really powerful uh, finding. Yeah, Alec, what do you, uh, well, I, I'll open up the mic to you to see whatever you're thinking, it, but I'm really curious to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, very interesting um, so far. And I, I think the, the sodium, sort of stood out to me. Um, one, it, this patient's like rather young to sort of reach a category where the patient doesn't have access to free water and we didn't get the sense that they had significant dysphagia or anorexia that would um, lead them to, it would be an, an, an intake problem. So see, clearly it's a loss problem. And the very low urine osm in the setting of a high sodium um, is very evocative of a central DI as you know, Shreyas and um, the prior doctors diagnosed. But the question is why? Um, and you know, I, I think with signs of reticular endothelial involvement and other things, certainly you have to be thinking about infiltrative diseases, particularly in the pituitary. And I would be very fascinated to know um, what company that this DI keeps. Are there other signs of endocrinopathies potentially here that uh, haven't revealed themselves? Or whether this is true isolated um, central DI and, um, you know, whether or not there was head imaging done or other things that could further investigate that first, because it's not an endpoint diagnosis. Uh, I mean, sometimes you don't find the cause, hence the idiopathic, but uh, I think I'd still be waiting for other um, tests, not only to figure out what, what's causing it or whether there are other associated um, sort of symptoms or syndromes related to that. Um, so I think those are my initial thoughts. I, I think something else that struck me with the labs is I was expecting some sort of bilirubin elevation with the reportedly objective evidence of icterus on exam. Um, but it's strikingly normal. Um, so either um, this is something that we missed um, and in past in time, or people just have sort of
generation and have uh, of their eyes and have some pterygium and other things that cause yellowness. Um, or um, there is something, a gap in my knowledge there, we didn't get a sense that they're eating a bunch of carrots or something else to cause the eyes to be yellow. Um, so I, I don't know if that's just um, something that's a, sort of a red herring or something that we're going to have to track further and trend the labs to see if there's other clear signature there. But I'm sort of anxious, oh, sorry, anxiously awaiting um, the CBC as well to get a to get a further sense of exactly what's going on. And the inflammatory markers aren't unexpected. Um, you know, we know that the patient is inflamed, and otherwise, um, I, I think those are my initial thoughts. Um, what are you thinking, uh, Robbie? No, I'm right there with you. Um, I think that that was uh, an excellent explanation of the the hypernatremia, and I love that you emphasize the importance of water intake. Hypernatremia is a much simpler problem than hyponatremia because there are no mimics. What hyponatremia fundamentally is, is the attempt to try to diagnose hypoosmolarity. But the sodium, uh, um, the so the low sodium to high excess of water inference that we make, a low a serum sodium means a high amount of water, is an inference that may be imperfect because there may be other things falsely, uh, um, uh, uh, there may be things that are inhibiting that connection. But truly, hypernatremia does not have a differential diagnosis. There's only one thing that does that, and that's excessive water loss compared to intake. But here's the punchline. No matter how much water one is losing, if you have access to water, you should be able to overcome any amount of water loss, no matter what that is. So if someone has a water loss problem for whatever reason, and they have access to water, they should be able to overcome it. That is why the presence of hypernatremia implies the universal presence of either a loss of access to water or encephalopathy, too confused to drink, or a targeted lesion in the hypothalamus that suggests adipsia or a loss in the thirst mechanism. And so here you'd wonder, is the patient a little confused and we're not realizing it? Is the patient having a focal strategic hypothalamic lesion suggestive of the presence of adipsia? Or is the patient not having access to water? And I think those are really, really key considerations. But um, in instances where there is no slam dunk answer in terms of the three A's, we have to search for an excessive water loss. And we see that the water loss is happening in the kidneys because despite the serum being so thick and full of sodium, the urine is dilute and full of water, implying that the reason the blood is so thick is because it's losing water into the urine. And the question is, with the water loss in the urine, is it as a result of ADH deficiency or ADH resistance? And by giving the patient ADH, we see that the problem is fixed, which means that there isn't ADH resistance, but rather ADH deficiency, pointing us to think about the hypothalamus. And that's why in this patient, understanding her hypothalamus both from the perspective of the diagnosis of central diabetes insipidus, but also the hypothesis that there may be a, a, an adipsic form of central diabetes insipidus is really, really important. Um, the vast majority of hypothalamic diseases reflect extension of a pituitary disease into the hypothalamus. And so... Um, the branch point, initial branch point of hypothalamic disease is to actually understand what's happening in the pituitary and to make an inference that a pituitary process has then extended into the hypothalamus. Um, but I think it's hard, as you said, Alec, to ignore the profound systemic signature of this disease to help us conjecture on what's happening up upstairs. And it reinforces the point that there are two sites of infiltrative diseases in the brain. Whenever you're thinking about a systemic disease that is infiltrating the brain, distinct from taking up space uh, or causing tumefactive lesions in the brain, goes to two places. The meninges, 
So subacute meningoencephalitis is a classic presentation of all the, the infiltrative diseases we know, granulomatous infections, sarcoidosis, histiocytes, uh, and um, tumors. But the other site is the pituitary. The, all the infiltrative diseases from tuberculosis to histoplasmosis to sarcoidosis to lymphoma also love to infiltrate the pituitary. So I think uh, in this patient, we now, we had no pre-existing reason to cure the status of her neurologic dimension. Uh, but now that the polydipsia and polyuria has translated to confirmed central diabetes insipidus with concern for adipsic features, I would think an MRI pituitary protocol is key for this patient, as is the analysis of her systemic uh, fingerprint and try to synthesize those two together. Um, very, very intriguing to mention, um, Shreya Saad. Uh, Alec, any other th uh, further reflections since I've been babbling away? Otherwise, we'll uh, pass the mic to Shreya. No, amazing as always, Robbie. And Shreya, thanks so much so far for this amazingly organized case and can't wait to hear more. <laughs> Sure. So I'll give you the blood, uh, the CBC. So the hemoglobin was 9.5 and WBC was 12,000 with a neutrophil predominance. Uh, I don't have an exact differential percentage, but uh, the eosinophils were normal. Platelet count was 95,000 per cubic millimeter. MCB was 82. And the iron panel, uh, the iron studies, uh, she had a total iron of 34 and the normal for the lab was 35. The TIBC was normal. Transferrin was 232, which is elevated. Percentage saturation of transferrin was greater than 55%, which was increased. Ferritin was 3,536 nanogram per ml, which was elevated. TIBC was 51. Uh, SPEP and UPEP were not obtained. Uh, and her fibrinogen levels were low. Urine analysis was normal. And she had uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV viral panels were all negative. And she also had uh, ANA, ANA was negative, ANCA was negative, and complement levels were within normal limits. Dengue serology was negative, malarial parasite was negative, and salmonella typhi OH. AH and BH antigens uh, were tested using the Wydal test. Uh, we're all one is to 20, which is not significant. And because of the concern of uh, what was going on centrally, she underwent an, an extensive investigation where uh, I have some labs which I want to share. FSH was 10 units per liter, which is the lower limit of normal. The luteinizing hormone LH was 1.48, which was also low. Early morning serum cortisol was 26, which is also low. TSH was 1.74, which is normal. Vitamin D was 38 nanomoles per liter, which was normal. Serum ADH was 43.8, which is also normal. Uric acid was 2.9, which was normal. And T3 was 9.83, which was normal. And TSH was normal. Prolactin was 18, which was also normal. And for her uh, black tarry stools, medical gastroenterology was consulted and uh, uh, they made certain recommendations based on imaging which was obtained. Uh, and I'll share the imaging with you uh, in the next aliquot or I can do it now, whatever works. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the time now. Why, why don't we get the imaging now just for the sake of time? I want to make sure. I'll... Sure. So, uh, she got a chest x-ray done, and that showed lobar consolidation of the right lower lobe, which was consistent with community-acquired pneumonia. And uh, there was a sad uh, story. The patient uh, deteriorated very rapidly and actually passed away uh, during the submission, so she could not be worked up completely. Um, and there was also a decision to get a skin biopsy, which unfortunately could not be obtained from the lesions which I had shown previously. Uh, but however, she was started on uh, CPAP for her worsening shortness of breath, and she was started on broad spectrum antibiotics for community acquired pneumonia. And uh, with regards to the edema, which was widespread, there was an echo which was done, and it showed no regional wall motion abnormalities. Ejection fraction was 60%, and there was no vegetations or valvular lesions. Blood cultures were obtained, and they showed no growth. And 
There was ultrasound of the lungs, neck, and abdomen. And uh, with regards to the ultrasound of the lungs, there was minimal free fluid in the left pleural cavity and mild to moderate right-sided pleural effusion with collapse and consolidation of the basal segment of the right lung. Thyroid was normal in size, and there were enlarged lymph nodes in the neck with loss of fatty hilum and the lymph node, the largest lymph node measured 2.5 to 1.3 centimeters. And there were multiple enlarged lymph nodes at the bilateral and cervical two, three, and four next stations of lymph nodes. An ultrasound of the abdomen showed hepatomegaly with grade three fatty liver. And there was massive splenomegaly, which was noted. And the spleen size was 20.2 centimeters and multiple non-enhancing wedge-shaped hypodensities throughout the spleen, which were splenic infarcts. And there was also lumbar spine imaging, which was obtained, and it showed a lytic lesion at the L3 level with sclerotic margins, and the radiological report uh, reported it as a non-ossifying fibroma. And I have uh, one final imaging and uh, the last aliquot, and I think uh, I'll stop here. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Alec. What's what's going in your mind? I think the we started to get some clarity, and now chaos has ensued in terms of imaging, and unfortunately, the outcome for the patient. What are you? Where are your head at? Yeah, really sorry to hear about the patient. Um, but I'm looking forward to learning um, from this experience. But um, you know, I think the the thrombocytopenia. I was I, I was honestly expecting more of a deep thrombocytopenia here, so it's a little bit surprising. Um, you know, I, patients frequently with platelets that low don't typically get petechiae certainly can happen, but I, I think her exam, if we're calling this petechiae, seems to be out of proportion. So it makes me think about something wrong with the coagulation or the vessel integrity itself. And the fact that the echo is normal, um, but the patient has profound edema, um, makes really sort of evokes the possibility of a vascular, vascular relief phenomenon. Um, and you know something else that I'm tracking, it seems like the fibrinogen is low, um, which in the setting of anemia and thrombocytopenia, certainly you need to think about the IC. We didn't get the coagulations, um, the coags as far as, and maybe I missed them, but I, I didn't see them. Um, but the other thought would be, um, you know, what is the, the possibility that this patient has significant um, liver disease and, and, and in fact has maybe some portal hypertension and the low fibrinogen could be explained by that. Um, but at the same time, the complement levels seem to be normal. Um, so that would suggest that the synthetic function maybe isn't quite as bad as I was anticipating. Um, so those are things that I, I'm tracking there. The ferritin, I think, just speaks to the patient's inflammation, but also if they have some concurrent liver disease could also affect the labs, as you've discussed a lot about, Robbie. Um, <clears throat> the FSH and LH being low, I, I don't know what the patient's uh, menstrual status is and where we are um, there, so I think that would be helpful information to obtain, but certainly could be suggestive of some underlying pituitary dysfunction. And the early morning cortisol um, certainly as well could be suggestive of, of something in the pituitary going on, but with the degree of the patient's illness, and this propensity, which the flavor we're getting of an infiltrative disease, um, certainly the adrenals can be involved. And, and so we're gonna have to clarify that as well. The thyroid study is being normal. Um, that either speaks that this isn't fully infiltrative and the patient does not have pen hypopituitarism, or sometimes the labs can be very difficult to interpret in the setting of central um, hypothyroidism. So that's just something I'm, uh, I'm also tracking as well. And doesn't dissuade me from wanting to, to do additional imaging of her brain if that's something that we were able to obtain before, uh, unfortunately she passed away. Um, the hepatosplenomegaly, again, um, suggestive of, of something <clears throat> infiltrative here, um, or the liver is causing significant portal hypertension. But again, there are some doubts to that uh, hypothesis. But I would also be interested in the smear uh, with everything that's going on as well. Um, glad to hear about the all the infectious studies, HIV. I didn't mention it again earlier, but that would have been important to get earlier on. Uh, so thank you, Shreyas, for that. Um, and then it seems like the patient is in an endemic area for dengue and malaria, and um, I'm glad that those have, have been excluded. And I guess additional things um, I'm probably uh, missing here. Um, you know, there seems to be a paramonic effusion um, in addition to this consolidation here. And it would be very helpful to know, um, it seems like the dyspnea time course is actually has been more subacute to a chronic. Um, and so if we're gonna call this a community acquired pneumonia with all of the prior hospitalizations, I would be very interested to know if the prior imaging demonstrated this infiltrate or if this is truly new. Certainly the patient is at 
uh, potential risk for getting acute myocardial pneumonia, but the chronicity of this would be very helpful to dissuade me that, that it's not that um, in combination with everything else and whether or not additional characterization with a CT scan, if available at an institution or bronchoscopy if necessary, would be helpful to really decide if this is truly um, a typical bacterial infection, which I'm getting the sense that it perhaps it is not. Um, now, you would treat as such until you could get more diagnostics, but um, there's enough to, to say that there's more than just community-acquired pneumonia going on here. Um, and then the the bone lesion, the lytic lesion, I, honestly, I, I would have to sit down with a radiologist and say, in the combination with the clinical syndrome, is this truly signal here? Is this more noise? It seems like they read it as a fibroma, and that could just be a gap in my knowledge, but I'm honestly not putting as much cognitive energy to that, but I'd be interested to, to see what, Robbie, you think about that. Um, and then the spleen with the multiple infarcts, we didn't get any sense that there's embolic phenomenon um, from coming from the heart. Now, in theory, there could be coming from other places, or it could be that the spleen is very large and has just outgrown its vascular supply, and that could be explaining the splenic infarcts as well, or whether that's another site of a systemic infection that we're potentially considering here. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I have, a, a again, a clear sense of what the exact diagnosis is, but I think we're getting more of a sense that this is... Um, you know, a syndrome that's involving the, the pulmonary system for sure. There's a flavor of vascular leak and there's some cytopenias associated with this. Um, and uh, definitely a central component with the, uh, the pituitary um, going on as well, that we're gonna have to get more clarity on. Um, and I think all those in combination are potentially suggestive of, of something infiltrative or granulomatous. Um, and with the negative autoimmune studies, potentially less, more in keeping with either malignancy or um, an infection. And um, I guess, yeah, those are my thoughts. And let me stop rambling and pass it to you, Robbie. Not at all. No, no, this is absolutely superb. And there's so much nuanced analysis that you're doing here. And it's very, very advanced, especially the notion that the idea that the splenic infarcts may not be as noise, but maybe just a consequence of the spleen outgrowing its blood supply. I think that's very, very nuanced. And I think in these kind of cases, you really have to, as you said, um, try to distill down the theme. And I think you've distilled it really down to an infiltrative disease type. And I think the nature of the infiltration here is reticular endothelial, as you've alluded to, and, and has a propensity for the pituitary. Because ultimately, if you step back and say, um, um, what are the features that are asymmetric? and kind of stand out from the nature of infiltrate, the broad category of infiltrative disease, I would make the argument that it's probably the pulmonary involvement. It's a little unusual for a pulmonary involvement to be a site of infiltration. It's often the source of infiltration, evocative of the kinds of granulomous infections that, you, um, uh, that, um, um, that we entertain. So if we if we do um, dance around the idea of an infiltrative disease and I'll put put broadly in front of us um, the major categories that we often think about infection, autoimmune, and malignancy, I'm curious if you were now now that you've done that analysis to like to, to zoom in and be like, well, are you starting to suspect specific infections, specific autoimmune diseases, and specific cancers, and then also like how are you uh, calculating the the probabilities of the infection, autoimmune, and cancer hypotheses? at this juncture? Where is your head at with that zoomed in dimension? Yeah, thanks so much, Robbie. Um, I think in combination with the, the pulmonary syndrome, which temporally seems to be more subacute to chronic, and in fact, that it isn't the entry site to many of the granulomatous infections, as you, as you frequently say, um, you know, I guess the patients, uh, where they're from and endemically, I, I think certainly I've been thinking about TB and then the other endemic mycoses, um, I think particularly histoplasmosis, just with his propensity to cause hepatosplenomegaly. And the bone lesions may be more, you know, associated with, with coxy, but the sort of just diffuse nature of the disease and the bone marrow involvement makes me think it's unlikely to be that. I also don't know exactly where the patient is from and what um, endemic mycoses they may be exposed to. But certainly as far as infections are concerned, um, I would be thinking a lot about TB um, and the endemic mycosis in particular, histoplasmosis. Um, and then um, I think I don't have a robust deal in the script for leishmaniasis or other things, but I feel like that would probably be less in keeping with that. But, um, you know, and I think just the, the febrile syndrome, the fact that sort of the rapid worsening of the disease is, is having me more of a gut is, instinct to prioritize infection. Um, and then as far as malignancies, it, it's, it's really hard to evoke um, you know, a, a pulmonary malignancy, which you could consider, but to, to to metastasize directly to the pituitary nowhere else, is, at least as far as we know, would be seemingly a little bit atypical. Um, so most of the malignancies I would be considered would be liquid, and, and in particular lymphoma would be the one to be to, to consider, um, just because it can do anything. <laughs> 
Um, and then autoimmune disease, you know, certainly sarcoid loves uh, the pituitary, um, but I, I don't feel like the signature of disease is necessarily in keeping with that. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I would love to be wrong and, and to learn that. But uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know what, what you're thinking. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think that the, you know, in a case that's so complicated that this is the first thing I, my mind does is to make sure that I'm not making the assumption that a single disease explains everything. It's so plausible that the patient has a malignancy and has a superimposed infection. And so that's the error of trying to tease these out. But I think the theme is absolutely right. Like more life-threatening, you should think of infection. And then when you filter the granulomatous infections by the patient's pre uh, presence in India, I think TB, histo, and visceral respiratory should be at the top of your list. And TB should be based on base rate for sure. Histo might be prioritized based on the degree of hyperferritinemia. It, does, it tends to do so much more than TB. And then the leishmaniasis might be prioritized based both on the degree of the splenomegaly and also the presence of the rash, which might be interpreted in a, in a different non-petechial light given the presence of a platelet count of 95,000. In terms of the malignancy hypothesis, I think it's very possible. You know, you have massive splenomegaly and the bigger the spleen, the more likely it's to be malignant. But that enthusiasm for that hypothesis has to be tempered by the fact that the LDH is not even mildly elevated. And so the lack of LDH elevation is a decent argument against prioritizing malignancy. And the only autoimmune disease that does this really reliably is sarcoidosis, but the one that will sneak up on you and snuck, snuck up on me not too long ago is histiocytic diseases. And they should they deserve mention because of the skin involvement, but more importantly, because of the powerful pituitary involvement that they have a strong tropism for the pituitary. So whenever you have a pituitary and skin disease, let alone featuring lung and spleen, I think a histiocytic condition uh, like Langerhead cell histiocytosis, Erdheim Chester, or as uh, we were fooled on a Friday, RLR of Rosai-Dorfman disease. Um, and um, yeah, I think that ultimately tissue is the issue unless you get lucky with um, indirect microbiological assessments like a histoangin or a TB uh, AFB or a, a visual lesmoniasis antigen. Um, and um, for me, I think that... Um, the center of gravity is so um, hard to pin, but I'm really struck by the size of that spleen and wonder if just the sheer weight of the spinomegaly is ultimately a telling clue. But those, you know, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Malignancy is fading because of the LDH not being prominent, but lights back up again because it's a no misdiagnosis. The autoimmune disease that's really catching my eye in this case is more than sarcoid is histiocytic diseases um, because of the powerful pituitary involvement. And I think all three infections, TB, histo, and visual asthmasis have their merit, but they also have their downsides. Um, absolutely fascinating um, um, case, and I'm curious where it went next, Treyas. Sure. Uh, I just want to go back to the medical gastroenterology opinion, which was sought uh, for uh, for the black stools, although it stopped. Uh, and uh, the ultrasound showed a grade three fatty liver, which was extremely uh, uh, heterogeneous. And so they thought that it could be uh, decompensated liver disease. But the fact that the patient does not uh, consume a lot of alcohol, so they thought it could be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which uh, went into decompensation. And uh, they felt that it could be uh, a variceal bleed, which was uh, causing the, uh, the, the black color stools. But then going back to uh, some more tests, which was obtained. Uh, they did do a uh, FNAC of the cervical lymph node. They unfortunately, while the patient was alive, could not get a lymph node biopsy. Uh, so they got the FNAC of a cervical lymph node and it showed granulomatous lymphadenopathy uh, and mature small lymphocytes and cells containing grooves. And there was also an MRI brain which was obtained. And the notable finding in MRI was absent pituitary bright spot and there was no stock enhancement. And uh, the patient unfortunately passed away, and they had to. Um, they wanted to know what was going on, so they ultimately performed an autopsy, and um, uh, the autopsy specimen will reveal the final diagnosis uh, in the next half part. No, oh, Alec, what are the <laughs> I mean, Shrey, Shrey, this is just uh, this is amazing. Um, but um, you know, I, I think the granulomatous inflammation sort of just confirms some of our suspicions. Um, and I think in combination with everything, I I, I think the prioritization, uh, you know, at least you'll have to teach me, my, my own description of histiocytic diseases are very, very, very poor, but I feel like the granulomata um, on, the, on the biopsy would be less consistent with that. But um, I think 
Um, I'm not sure that the order really changes all that much. I think I'm still prioritizing infection. And the question is which one? I, I don't know what the grooves means. Um, so I, that would be something I would have to look up. Um, <clears throat> so I guess to confirm what exactly this is, either we're awaiting, um, like you said, serologic or um, you know antigen testing from the urine, but it sounds like the autopsy is gonna get the final diagnosis. So um, I would imagine either sort of excising one of the lymph nodes or, or looking particularly in the spleen, um, about you know what we're seeing and, and staining for, and I think just by you know, base rate, I would, I would probably prioritize uh, TB. But um, certainly histoplasmosis is I I've seen it do things similar to this before, and, and so would be remiss not to mention that as well. Um, and then you know, less when I says I've never seen it, um, I, I don't feel quite as comfortable with that, so I'd have to lean in on you for that. But I'm not sure the order of events changes all that that um, that much for me. Uh, but I would be interested to see how how you're interpreting this information. Yeah, you know, um, at the end of the day, I think that it's impossible to really predict the diagnosis as you're alluding to. I, I will say that um, it, it is not um, characteristic of histiocytic diseases to show up as granulomatous inflammation, but by their macrophage base, basis, they certainly can. Um, and so I think that um, the presence of granul, it probably depend on how much granulomatous inflammation you're seeing. But for me, um, I just... I think these cases are all about trying to weigh the relative invasion of certain organs. And I'll tell you where I'm stuck. I'm stuck with the white count to pituitary infiltration ratio. And let me explain that. Well, one, I just want to clarify, Shreyas, I don't know if you, you know, I mean, I know you're putting this case together for presentation purposes, but it would change our analysis so much if the patient then became pancytopenic. Do you happen to know if the white count was always a little bit elevated or... Um, or was it a true all just once and then became low, or you just don't know? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what uh, she she did multi must visit multiple hospitals, but I I, I don't know what the blood count was yeah. uh, in those no worries. Yeah. no worries at all. I think that you know the pattern of signature here, the signature of the dissemination is a little weird. So if we're playing the card of TB, um, uh, TB, we're playing the card of the infection the degree of um, bone marrow involvement and the degree of liver. And like, you know, if you look at that ALKFOS, it doesn't look like it's infiltrating the liver much. It doesn't look like it's fully infiltrated the bone marrow because the white count's so high um, or not even close to low. And I'm just so struck by the prominent tropism for the pituitary. Like it seems to be being, being sucked towards it. And um, in general, when you're thinking about the, calculus of inflammation in the pituitary of either infection, autoimmune, and malignancy. It really is, set, is skewed significantly towards malignancy and autoimmune disease. If you look at the base rate of panhypopituitarism, odds are you're going to find a cancer or you're going to find an autoimmune disease. Um, infections causing panhypopit are super duper duper rare. And so the tension that I'm having is, does that overcome the base rate of the sheer prevalence of infections and systemic inflammation? And I'm having a very, very hard time with that. But, but here's the really profound reflection to have out loud, which is that the patient um, uh, does not have a space occupying pituitary process. So here we are thinking, okay, uh, infections and pituitary, could they micro infiltrate the pituitary possibly? Um, but you wonder what the negative imaging finding does for the pituitary calculus. And so here, I think the base rate would suggest a granulomatous infection overall, but I'm having trouble counterbalancing that with the base rate of pituitary disease, which tends to favor malignancy over autoimmune, malignancy and autoimmune disease. And also that the pituitary imaging is negative, which lowers my, um, uh, which lowers the um, probability in my mind of an overt malignant involvement. So gosh, I think the the um, the cat the infections are no miss, but I think what I would really really ask the pathologist to do on on analyzing analyzing this is of course the crazy micro that we always try to do. But I think it's very easy to miss, miss subtle histiocytic diseases. And I would just hate for that to be overlooked. So I'm right there with you. I don't know. I think the trifecta of infiltrative disease is up on the wall. And um, I would just make note that they're all fair game, but the powerful tropism for histiocytic diseases and sarcoid to the pituitary is a very, very prominent one. 
Um, and going back, the adipsic component of central diabetes insipidus is a classic manifestation of the autoimmune pituitary diseases like sarcoid and histiocytic diseases. So I'm, I can't, I can't commit to one over the other, um, but just making note of that, um, that twisted dimension. Uh, any additional thoughts, Alec, before we heal the reveal from Shreya? No, incredibly nuanced discussion. And, and then um, I guess the only other thought I had is um, whether or not in the patient's hospital, of course, they got steroids at all, just the severity of illness and how that could affect the um, the white count as well, and, and whether that could just be leading us astray. Because you're right, usually, particularly those infiltrative infections, um, it's panthidipenia, and the white count is out of proportion, and that's not something that I had, had picked up on. So thank you for, for pointing that out for me. But um, Shreyas, I'm very excited to, uh, to to learn from you and, and, and to hear more about the Sure. Um, so the postmortem bone marrow biopsy was performed and it, it was suggestive of a reactive bone marrow with cellularity of 60% and uh, special fungi staining was done uh, for the infiltrative fungal disorders and none of them showed up. Uh, and she also had an autopsy of the pituitary gland and it showed large ovoid CD1A reactive histiocytes and confirmed the final diagnosis of Langenhans cell histiocytosis. And the final diagnosis of, uh, she also, the uh, treating team was also considering the possibility of uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, suggested by the elevated head score of 224, which puts her at a 96 to 98% probability of HLH, and also Langerhans cell histiocytosis based on suggestive clinical findings of rash, lytic bone lesions, and infiltrative symptoms uh, uh, suggested by the infiltrative pituitary uh, uh, signature of uh, central diabetes sensitivity. Yes, I can see why you were like typing in the VMR Excel spreadsheet. Oh my God, I have all the data, I have all the data. Oh, this is, um, yeah, this is a case that is educational beyond um, belief, really. Um, I have a lot of reflections to share, but I I, um, I tend to ramble a lot at the end, as you just saw in the last aqua. So I'll pass the mic to, uh, to Alec to get your reflections first, please. Uh, I mean, I, I think it just... Um... It's just amazing to me, Robbie, like how you picked up on just those very mild subtleties. Um, it just speaks to your underlying understanding of all these diseases and how they intersect and the subtleties of each. And I have a lot of reading to do on histiocytic diseases because um, honestly, that wasn't something that really I was considering at all. Um, so it's a great learning for me. Um, and, you know, Shreyas, what a case. Thank you so much for taking the time. I can't imagine how long it took to, to accumulate all this data and to format it in this way to present it to us within an hour. And, um, you know, really appreciate you and uh, just the work that all you and your other CP solvers members do um, to really make this experience just amazing. And, yeah, I'm going to have to rewatch this one many times and do a lot of reading, um, particularly on histostatic diseases. And um, so I'll be, always be remembering this one. So, um, yeah, um, what are your thoughts, Ravi? You know, um, I think uh, I think my I have so many thoughts. But I think the the ones that are crystallized now are um, mostly uh, mostly about gratitude. I think that um, the enthusiasm that we all felt uh, from Shreya's hyping and building this case as an educational exercise is only matched by the sheer amount of work that it took to put this together. You didn't see this patient this was referred to you and the amount of digging that you've had to do to organize it to create such an educational conversation is unreal. And I will say this, frankly, it's a huge privilege to sit here and be able to um, I'll, um, share the learning that we've all accumulated in this space. I have a lot of gratitude for you, Shreyas, for, uh, for all the work that you put in to make this happen, but also uh, uh, really the underlying crux, which is just your sort of pure passion for, for medicine. It's, it's wonderful to see. Um, for me, Alec, I think that uh, this case was a great demonstration consistently over and over and over again by you to, to, to not relent on the idea of trying to clarify what the problem is. And I think that um, at the end, especially, I was really kind of subconsciously making note of the fact that you didn't um, fall into the CPS allure of trying to just like throw out diagnoses and remain so authentic to that exercise of what is the problem. 
And that ultimately, I would venture to say, is the key to solving any case, but I think is most clarified in this case, where you, if you identify the problem as an infiltrative disease with disproportionate propensity, propensity to the pituitary, and then if you if you had done if we had done that, then you, all it takes, as you said, is the knowledge to know what that means, and the knowledge is out there. You know, it's not, it exists. You just have to curate and work on it. And for me, the knowledge was out there for me because I stumbled and fell right on my face on an RLR case two months ago that Andrew Sanchez and the Yale team presented of a histiocytic disease. And so I like went out and found that knowledge and worked on it. But that is that is easier to do if you have the drive for it and you have cases like this to stimulate. What's harder to do, I think, is to remain... Um, locked in to the idea of I'm not going to do what um, step one and step two and step three and, and um, the tendency in medicine to tell me what the answer is right away. And I think what we still do a little bit in VMR sometimes is we're like, what's the answer? What's the answer? And that that is oh, that is counterproductive to the art of knowing what is the problem. So to, for me, I think Shreyas, you I don't think a case in the history of VMR is emphasized just how key it is to represent the problem as precisely as possible. And that precision can either um, trigger the answer if you have the knowledge or trigger, it, trigger a targeted a search uh, in the literature and or Google to help you uh, figure out what's going on with your patient in real time. Really, really great demonstration of that. I wanna pass the mic to you, Shreyas, to get your thoughts and reflections and what it was like to learn from this case in real time and, and now. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present. I really want to uh, uh, give full credit to my uh, colleague who is actually an internal medicine resident here in India. He actually uh, shared this case with me and I have very fond stories. Uh, we used to listen to VMR together uh, ever since we were medical students and uh, now he's a resident and he, uh, he was the person who actually saw this patient and he shared this case with me and we were brainstorming and uh, nobody knew what was going on till we uh, till uh, the tissue diagnosis was ultimately revealed. So it was a very challenging um, uh, case uh, to ultimately diagnose. And uh, I believe he, he mentioned to me that even the treating team was really confused and they really wanted to pursue autopsy to figure out what was going on because uh, a 50 year old patient is pretty young and um, uh, just the skin rash and the lytic bony lesions, the hypernatremia, everything was uh, so unique and uh, they just really wanted to pursue what ultimately went wrong and this is what they came up with. Oh yeah, absolutely superb. Very, very enlightening story and I'm glad that so many more people get to learn from it. So please thank your friend from um, from our behalf. Um, I apologize, I have to leave just to make it on time uh, to work after this. So I will pass the mic to Kushala for the teaching points. Um, well, excited to catch them um, afterwards. I know Alec um, has uh, has duties after this too, so feel free to hop on as well. In that light, Shreyash, I made you the host, assuming that you can stay for the next few minutes to hear Kushal's great recap of this case. Thank you all so much. And as a quick heads up, the RLR VMR tomorrow is happening two hours um, earlier than it usually does. So two hours before we started today. Hope to see you guys there. Bye. And um, yeah, I have to leave here in a minute, but uh, I, I guess are we ready for the, the teaching points, Kushal, if you have a moment or um, I'm not sure if she's still with us, but. I think Kuchal maybe had to leave because of her connection issues, it looks like. Okay, excellent. Well, I mean, I, I think just to, you know, add to Robbie, um, just, you know, always so in awe of you all and just so thankful and just to be able to learn and to grow like this and to, you know, fall on my face. But um, I'm just like so excited to go learn and read more about histiocytic diseases and other granulomas infections that I'm just lacking in, in my knowledge. And I don't think I would feel comfortable to do that um, without you all here. And uh, Ravi just like, just always there with it, you know, uh, just, just amazing. And just, um, I love you guys. Um, and I hope you have an amazing day. And uh, thanks again, Treas. Everybody take care.
Thank you so much, everybody.